Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. We're in a house of God, but I can promise you that I'm not going to treat this panel with any reverence at all tonight, and neither should you. Uh, welcome to this debate. In the spirit of the age, I'm tempted to say I have never seen a crowd like this in my life. In fact, this must be the biggest debate crowd that London has ever seen. You are fabulous, people. All of you fabulous. Uh, but I'm not going to do that because we're not going to be talking about Donald Trump tonight. We are going to be reflecting on another nation which has uh, political challenges, shall we say, and a degree of turmoil in its midst, and that is our very own dear country. The title of our debate tonight is, as you all know, The Great Realignment, Britain's Political Identity Crisis. Uh, there could be nothing more timely, I think, given that we all know uh, that politics is in a state of flux. We have had in the recent past leaders like Tony Blair and David Cameron who were intent, preoccupied with winning the center ground. But right now, politics is a place where the center ground doesn't really seem to matter quite so much. There are more extremes, I would say, in British politics today, and then questions for all of us about where we sit with what we see in our politics. Our party politics, our Brexit politics, our nationalist politics, all of this is up for grabs and is raising profound questions about the alignment of British politics. So that's what we're going to explore. I'm going to introduce my fantastic panel in just a moment, but because this is an evening which is all about your involvement, you're going to get, I guarantee you, a chance to air your own questions much better than mine, I am sure, to our panel. It's about interactivity. So we're going to start by getting ourselves ready for total engagement with a, an audience question for you all. So please, on a show of hands, to set out how we feel as we go into this debate, please think about this and respond. How many of you, all of you here tonight, right now, are feeling politically homeless? If you're feeling politically homeless, raise a hand. Now this is awkward because I can't quite, I don't, I think it's about half perhaps. Raise, waggle them around really violently. Oh yeah, oh God, it's more than half. Actually, it's, it's three quarters. Okay, it's a very useful guide to our panel. Would you agree, panel, about three quarters? It's hard I can see. You what, want a recount? Why didn't you want <laughs> hey, I can't see. Oh, you can't see. Oh. <laughs> but, all right. Uh, well, ask for the other side. Ask for the other side. Oh, all right. Who has actually got a clear political home right now and feels they know where their home and their identity sits? Waggle, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're not a majority. You're. I, That's true. That's I'll true. be charitable and say you're a third. <laughs> you're between a quarter and a third. So. Homelessness, political homelessness, is going to be a big theme of this evening. Thank you for that, everybody. Let me very quickly introduce uh, the panel. I'm just going to go down the line. So I'm going to start with Anand Menon, who is Professor of European Politics and Foreign Affairs at King's College London, also Director of UK in a Changing Europe, which he insists is the best think tank in Britain today. He's not, of course, biased at all. It is, he says, a non-partisan initiative researching the complex relationship between the UK and the EU. Next to Anan, a familiar figure, I'm sure, to all of you, Hilary Benn, uh, a very senior figure in the Labour Party, not currently in the shadow cabinet, but he has served in Labour cabinets, and he is currently chair of the uh, Parliamentary Brexit Select Committee. Next to Hillary is David Goodhart. He is the founding editor of Prospect Magazine. He's currently the head of the demography unit at the Think Tank Policy Exchange. And because he's an author, he insists, I tell you, that his, his book, The Road to Somewhere, The Populist Revolt and the Future of Politics, is available outside this hall. <laughs> Depending on the quality of his arguments, you may or may not be interested in that by the end of the evening for you to judge, not me. Uh, next to David, we have Helen Lewis. Helen is deputy editor at the New Statesman, writes uh, a great deal about the political scene in this country. She also broadcasts on it, I know, because I listened to her on The Week in Westminster on Radio 4. Uh, and frighteningly, for a tech Luddite like me, she also has a weekly tech column in the Sunday Times, which I read but don't understand. Um, <laughs> 
And then at the end of our panel, we have Ken Clark, uh, of course, uh, a, uh, is this a kind or an unkind word, a veteran of the uh, House of Commons, it's I think kind. father of the House, yeah. indeed. Yes, that's one of the most absurd titles I've ever had in my career. Really. Uh, yes, uh, I don't, oh, I can I, think I, of some I, I don't think I fathered any of them. Well, I am the uh, doyen of the members. <laughs> I'm there longer. Well, you know what? The <laughs> DNA testing will not be required, so we won't we won't go further into that. But I, I'm, I have a list here of all Ken's cabinet uh, posts. It's it's so long and arguably tedious that I won't go into it. But but <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer is a highlight. Uh, also, the fact that I run into him occasionally at the Kennington Tandoori is also a highlight. Right, right. Uh, so there we are. A warm hand for all of my panel. In the spirit of panel debate and to get things going, I want to hear from each of you in turn on this very simple, straightforward opening question. Is Britain facing a political identity crisis right now? Uh, let me start with you, David. Um, yes, I think it is, but political identity crises are necessary in politics. They have to happen every now and then because views of the electorate shift and the party system gets out of kilter with how public opinion has changed. I think. What's been happening, I think the big thing that's been happening over the last generation or so is that, the, that we've seen a kind of convergence of views on most of the big socioeconomic issues. It may not look like that given the Corbyn takeover of the Labour Party, but actually if you look at British Social Attitude surveys and so on, things like public spending, redistribution, size of the state, you've seen actually a convergence across classes and value groups to some extent too, I think. Um, the middle class is um, more egalitarian than it used to be. Perhaps that's because there's a bigger graduate professional element to it. The working class is less protectionist than it used to be. So you, you've seen a, a coming together on socioeconomic issues across the country. However, on socio-cultural issues, uh, issues to do with uh, the nation state and borders and group attachment um, uh, and pace of change and issues to do with, with terrorism and crime. Um, on, on these sorts of issues, you've, you've seen a divergence of views uh, across the country. And our party system doesn't really reflect this any longer. Um, it, there, there was a kind of... If, if Theresa May had got a big majority at the last election, I think the, the realignment would have started. It's, we've had a kind of half a realignment. Um, but at the moment... We, we, ha we are not seeing this shift. I mean, obviously, socio-economic politics remains very important, but socio-cultural politics has become so much more important and is now the... Def I mean, I think what will happen over the next 10, 15, 20 years is we will have a more liberal... I mean, the, some version of the Labour Party, a kind of middle... Um, a, 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 a version of the Labour Party representing the broad middle class that is, that is somewhat more liberal, more open, in favour of more openness and so on, than the Conservative Party that will, uh, that will care more about national boundaries and, and, and the security and identity issues. I mean, I think that we're kind of half, we haven't quite right. realigned yet, but you, we will do. Right, and you're still, I don't want to focus right now on this opening too much on party politics, but you're still focusing on two main parties dominating in the future, as far as you can oh, see yeah. it. So, I think so, yeah. But, but Ken, you next. The basic notion of a political identity crisis, of course, crises are bad things, and therefore this is a notion that something bad is happening. Do you think it is? Well, the crisis is very, very much on the European issue, which is why it's been the poison in British politics for about the last 30 years. I mean, essentially, I think people on the centre-right know where they differ from the centre-left. I feel quite comfortable, I think a lot of voters do, on most issues. Uh, I mean, Jenkinsites and Blairites have always distinguished themselves from One Nation Conservatives, uh, and outliers have joined in our two-party system in, in of taking their voters with them, with some very loyal bloc voters in the past. Now, Europe's always strained that. There's no party unity on Europe, on either side uh, of the aisle, uh, and the electorate realigns itself, and it's been doing so ever more dramatically in recent times. So that the Labour Party's dependence on the, certainly the ageing white working class in the North, uh, has, you know, they can't. They've gone. Uh, 
uh, when they stopped voting for UKIP, a lot of them voted for us. Uh, our reliance on young, professional, aspirational, business and professional people in the South and Southeast is gone. So this extraordinary general election, we win Mansfield <laughs> and they lose Canterbury. Uh, sorry, they, uh, and, uh, and, and, Labour, and, and Labour, Labour, Labour wins Canterbury. Well, that, it, but that was reflected all over the place. And in the House of Commons, the hard-line Eurosceptics, people like Jeremy Corbyn, people like Liam Fox, <laughs> with identical <laughs> views, <laughs> sit in cabinets and shadow cabinets and try to append to agree with people whose pro-European views are at least as strong as Hillary's and my own. Uh, uh, and that's why, it, because of all underlying angry protest, that's why things are broken up. Why it's broken up particularly, I'll be very brief, uh, it's partly the, the, the economic collapse, it's the loss of confidence in the global economy. A lot of people haven't benefited. We haven't really recovered from the 2007, 2008 crisis. And the other is the mass surge of migrants into this country, which is causing a huge problem for all the democratic West and uh, which a section of the public is getting increasingly alarmed about and they want to find scapegoats for the fact that the community is changing and, and they rather like uh, blaming Mexicans and wanting to build a wall if they're Americans or blaming Brussels and thinking it will all stop if only we leave the European Union here. Yeah, thanks, Ken. And we'll come back to the specific issues like immigration, I'm sure, in the course of the debate. But Helen, the, the big picture, I mean, Ken's just painted this topsy-turvy world where uh, the Tories win Mansfield when they actually perform pretty badly overall, and Labour extraordinarily wins places like Kensington and Chelsea and Canterbury as well. Topsy-turvy, but uh, is it bad? And, and what do you make of this notion of an identity crisis? I do think it is bad because I think it means that voting is very frothy and unpredictable. And actually, as we saw tonight, lots of people do feel homeless. I think there are a couple of divides that are now really strong. I mean, Ken picked this up, but what we've really seen is the decline of class-based voting. Actually, you cannot talk about there being this big class split anymore. And that's been replaced by different divides. So an absolutely huge one is graduates versus non-graduates. 90% of our MPs are graduates. Now, that is a problem because you have gra government by graduates for graduates. Look at the Brexit vote. 75% of people with a postgraduate qualification voted remain. Isn't that, isn't that linked to economic class? Absolutely. It's, it's linked to the... Well, because it doesn't matter so much where you came from as where you feel you're going. And I think that's a different thing about where the economy, who the economy <coughs> is perceived to work for. But the other big split as well, which also relates to this, is city versus country. And that's the story of, of Kensington, really, is that people in cities live alongside migrants and immigrants and ethnic diversity, but they are far more relaxed about that than as somebody who, who is living in a predominantly white town that has seen relatively small but dramatic changes in a sort of percentage terms. So somewhere like Boston in Lincolnshire was the most Brexit where I'm from. in the country. Mm. And actually, if you compare that with an inner London borough, that has not had the volume of migration that you would see there, but it has had a very rapid change. So there are, the other big one that I would mention is old versus young. And this was an election where Labour did a lot better than it expected to because youth turnout was very, very high. And that's a long-term problem for the Tories because the two stories really of their vote share are over 65s were repelled by the social care offer and stayed at home. And also their missing generation of Tory voters around the ages of 35 to 44, people who once might have expected to buy a house, settle down and vote Tory are now stuck in the private rented sector. They feel so much more insecure in their lives and they're not turning to the concern party in the way that their, their parents or their grandparents probably would have gone through that trajectory of their lives. So yeah, what you're seeing is exactly an identity crisis. Politics is becoming so much more unpredictable. I was looking at data today that suggested that between the Brexit referendum, a third of the people who turned out for that, either, sorry, 2015 election, either a third of those people who voted in the 2015 election either stayed at home or voted for a different party in 2017. That is an incredible level of churn in politics. Yeah, just... Hilary, to you next, uh, and again, the theme, the identity crisis, but I'm just wondering whether it is such a bad thing. You know, Helen kicked off by saying, yes, it is bad, and turbulence, froth, all of this sort of uh, churn in, in politics, but what, why is it, it makes you lot take much less for granted, maybe makes you work harder and think harder, so maybe it isn't a bad thing that we're talking about. Well, it's interesting. In recent years, we, we've been told the growth of multi-party politics, but actually at the election we had this year, 82.4% of people either voted Labour or Conservative, and you have to go back, I think, to 1970 to find the, the last time yeah. uh, that figure was to be found. Look, the nation 
is absolutely split down the middle on Brexit. And Ken is right that it is the, the issue that dominates our, our politics. And we're having to deal with the consequences. Now, what is that about? The 52% voted to leave because it was about migration, change, loss, austerity, how long you wait to see the doctor, the inability to find housing for your children, and a desire for control, the word of the referendum, in a world in which, because of the pace of change, it often seems as if, to many people, we have barely any control at all. And I think the message that the referendum sent, which is not just for the United Kingdom, but politics across uh, certainly Western countries, is the balance between, on the one hand, the recognition of the need for cooperation between nation states to deal with uh, terrorism, to deal with threats to peace and security, the movement of people, climate change, trade, and on the other hand, the wish to have some greater influence about how things work in our country. And what we've seen now is that on top of traditional party politics, we now have overlaid referendum politics, and I agree with Ken that each of our parties is having to deal with the consequences of that because we represent people who were on either sides of the particular debate. And the last thing I would say is that in a society where since the end of the Second World War, the story we have told ourselves is of onwards, upwards, better, Generation, my generation, we look at our children and we realise in terms of stable and secure job, ability to afford uh, a home, to be able to save for a pension, we know that our children, as things stand at the moment, are not going to enjoy the same life that we have enjoyed. And that is quite a challenge for politics, so perhaps it's not surprising that there is this crisis that we're debating here tonight. Mm. Uh, just in parentheses, I was fascinated to look at your face when Ken referred to Jeremy Corbyn as a die-hard Eurosceptic. You, you accept that, do you? No, he, he, he vote, campaigned for and voted <laughs> Remain. Uh, I, as, you, as you know, Steve. As my kids say to me, I'm just messing with you. Don't worry. In the most Delphic and strange way, he had his own personal reasons and didn't give any of the <laughs> You know what? I was naughty. I shouldn't have gone there at this point in the debate. The yeah, ever since there, he let, let's the save this one for later because <laughs> it's time to hear from Anand. And what I would say is, you know, <laughs> we, we, here we are in London. And uh, actually, hands up. How many of you are actually Londoners? And how many? Well, how many of you are Londoners? Waggle. So, we, oh my God, you almost all are. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and Helen and others have already referred to the new divides, one of which is sort of metropolitan against country, urban, but particularly London, frankly, more than anywhere, against sort of other parts of the country and, and non-urban areas. So, so we've got a London audience, we've got a panel who, if I may say so, I know not all of you are from London, but you all sound quite, you know, <laughs> London-ish. You know what I mean? I mean, in, 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 in the most, most well-spoken sense. But Anand, I know, is from, from uh, Wakefield in Yorkshire, just like I'm from Lincolnshire. You have a perspective that isn't necessarily... Well, it isn't London. So when you answer this question about uh, political identity crisis, Anand, reflect as well on, on the degree to which you hear a lot of stuff outside London that you don't necessarily hear in London. Well, first, I mean, the survey has yet to be designed that paints me as the archetypal denizen of Wakefield. <laughs> uh, true. <laughs> so true, I, true, true. I, I am not going to stand there as a representative of well. my hometown, but I, I'll, I'll, say, I'll, <laughs> I'll say two things. I'll say it's interesting that both MPs put the emphasis on Europe, because I think Europe is part of the story of our politics, but only part of it, because I think the other part of the story is the fact that from the early part of this century onwards, politics had been distancing itself from the people. You see this in all sorts of ways. You see it in falling party membership, falling voter turnout. You see it in all the British social attitudes polling on whether people trusted politicians, the fact that more and more people said they were all the same. Added to that, you had the expenses crisis. Added to that, you had the impact of the financial crisis. And I think there was a growing disenchantment with politics there anyway, before the referendum. What the referendum did in part was it allowed people to express that. So the other figure about comparing 2015 with the general election in 2016 is that three million people who couldn't find anyone to vote for in the general election went out and voted in the referendum. 
And the majority of those people voted to leave, partly as a protest against that system. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is to do with Europe. And this is why it's so messy. We have two problems going at once. We have the disillusion with politics and with the centrist politics of the Blair Cameron days. And secondly, we have this new divide, the divide over Europe, which is basically David's values divide. One of the greatest predictors of how people voted in the referendum was their view on authoritarianism versus liberalism or the death penalty or a whole number of ciphers. We have those, that divide added and as everyone has said so far, our political parties can't cope with that divide because it goes straight through them. So having the first crisis alone to deal with be, would pro problem enough for our political system, having both of them is leading to what we see nowadays in our politics. As to whether or not this is good or bad, what I would say is, let's see what comes out of it. Mm. I mean, if at the end of the day, for me personally, and this is a purely personal view, we end up in 10 years' time with a Britain that is far more equal, and the disparities between rich and poor, north and south and so far, have disappeared to an extent, then I'd say that was a very handy crisis, thank you very much. If we end up with a whole different future, then I'll reassess. Okay. You just said something interesting. Uh, and I want to pick up on it, uh, about the, the, the centre ground and the degree to which uh, politics at the moment appears to have left the centre ground, and I, I, I mentioned it too. Do you think that's really true? Because, you know, the, the received wisdom in, in democratic politics, not just in this country, but in most Western democracies, is that you win by winning the centre ground. Is that no longer a safe assumption to make in the United Kingdom today? I, I think we exaggerate that. I think there is a huge support still, you know, 80, 90% of the electorate support what? A, a regulated market economy, a, by historical standards, a very large state, you know, a kind of 40% state. The Tories may want 38%, Labour may want 42%. I mean, these are relatively sort of minor disputes. And a, and a public realm that is, that is pretty egalitarian and, and permissive in its assumptions about about our, our, our fellow citizens. Uh, I mean, within, you know, so, so that's, that's very big picture. Within that, of course, we have the value divisions and, and these value groups, I call them uh, in my book, the, the, the anywhere people who are about 25% of the population, the, the more educated and mobile people and the somewhere people, about 50%, who tend to be much more rooted, less, less well educated and so on. That These value divides that have partly taken over from the, from the class division um, are, are, are real and important and, and, and are leading to this, 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 um, this, this identity crisis, you might say. But it doesn't detract from the fact that, that you know, I mean, look around the world, you know, just remember, you know, actually, what a high degree of consensus there is on the very, very big picture stuff. Yeah, but, but you could argue in, in British politics today, I mean, for example, before uh, the quite extraordinary election result, the received wisdom was, I don't know, Hillary, whether you would acknowledge this, but the received wisdom was that, that Jeremy Corbyn's offer, you know, an out-and-out -out left offer, was never going to appeal successfully to the British public because the British public, on the whole, always reverted to some sort of centrism. You could argue Corbyn's blown that apart. And you could also argue that because the Tory party at the moment seems to be driven by people who are very passionately pro-Brexit, and I think in the past you've used the word headbangers about some of them, uh, that, that both our main political parties are being driven by people who aren't that fussed about the centre ground. But what was so radical in the Labour manifesto, I think that's the exactly. fascinating exactly. thing, is people have this idea, and it's one of the reasons for Jeremy Corbyn's appeal, is that he's a very radical figure. But you look at that manifesto, and it was a soft left manifesto. Okay, so taxing people over £80,000 a year is something that we haven't been allowed to say for 20 or 30 years in British politics. But it's not, it's hardly full communism now, is it, really? Mm. And, mm -hmm. you know, Wholesale you... nationalisation? I mean, even Andrew Adonis under the Blair government was talking about individual bidding contracts for rail companies, and I don't think there's anybody here who would argue that the privatisation of rail has been an unqualified success, right? Who are these people that there are? I think, and, and part of the, the reason that Jeremy Corbyn succeeded is that the Tory was also offering a very radical change. There was no status quo at this election. Yeah. And yeah. therefore, I think it's, it's, it's very odd to talk about the idea that you know, the centre ground has completely gone because Corbyn is this very, very radical figure. 
Yeah, okay. Okay, can I just, I mean, on, on that point, I mean, in some ways, the Tory manifesto was to the left of the Labour manifesto. And, I mean, on the intergenerational justice thing, after all, the Tories were proposing to reduce subsidies for the affluent old, and Labour was proposing to increase subsidies for the affluent young by abolishing tuition fees. I mean, it was extraordinary. But it was the only grown up policy either side produced during the entire election. And it was, <laughs> uh, it was, so it was abandoned after two days. I don't think Corbyn's policies played a part in it, really. His personality and the desire to protest, a lot of people voted for him, confident, because all the pundits told them this that he wasn't going to win anyway, and to save him from oblivion, really. So it was an extraordinary result, and I, I, but I don't think it shows any surge to extremes amongst the public. The basic centrist views of the British people are still there, and I won't go, go on, but the, I, it's the actual political world itself which has accidentally got itself into this situation where it produces more extremists than it used to, and is no longer dominated by its centre. It's a reaction, really, to the cynicism, which I, I, I agree is at an extraordinary, ludicrous height. At a, I mean, the Spencer's crisis scandal was a genuine scandal. But the adolescent, cynical view of the average member of the public, who will tell you they're all crooks, they all lie, there's no difference between them. They're only in it for what they get out of it. That carries 80% of the public. Uh, the, the, the result is they won't join political parties. They won't have anything to do with them. They dislike them as institutions. Well, I mean, except Labour's membership is the record high. Yeah, behind. but it's not representative. They yeah. have a very young membership, which is very left-wing. It doesn't remotely represent the broad brush of Labour voters. We have a very small so membership of ageing people who are really quite right-wing and not remotely representative of the general Conservative vote. <laughs> and, 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 this pretty, and both parties rather stupidly gave in to some campaigns to, to democratise themselves. Uh, so, so, so the actual leadership of the parties and the pressures within the parties are driven by these unrepresentative groups. Uh, and if, if we had went back to the days of mass membership, we would have a centrist, one nation, modernising leader. If the Labour Party could reverse this ridiculous rule that gave anybody a vote for three quid, uh, they would go back to having somebody like Hillary uh, as, as their leader. Uh, and so again, it's a disconnect between the political party system mm. in Parliament and the general electorate, but I agree with those who've said the basic instincts of the sensible bulk of the electorate, whether they be left or right, uh, can be defined if someone's already defined them. Uh, They're very much the same. You two both have a Hillary then. To come uh, back to the question. Um, <laughs> well, why, why restrict no, yourself well, to that? Well, all right, <laughs> all right, all right. There are so many wonderful avenues <laughs> that we, we can wander over. I again. think it remains the case that to win, you have to win the centre ground. But I think it is also the case that where the centre ground is now has shifted. And I think that is why the manifesto, which uh, got a very good reception, if you take the example of the housing crisis, take the private rented sector, the 11 million people that you mentioned, there is a much greater appetite now for uh, longer term tenancies for tenants, caps on rent increases during the terms of the tenancy. Indeed, our policy, which I helped develop when I was the shadow communities and local government secretary, that uh, lettings agent fees should no longer be paid by tenants, but by the landlords, has actually been pinched by the government. And I, well, I think that is an example of where opinion has moved for the reasons I think that Anand set out so clearly. People see the things that aren't working and therefore are much more willing to be open to parties and people who come along and say, well, here's something that we can do about them. And people say, well, yes, that makes sense. That's something I will vote for. And railway renationalisation, I have to tell you, is fantastically popular around the country. I used to travel for five years on the only state-owned railway in the UK, East Coast Trains, and when they came to relet the contract, the government said any railway company in the world, including every state-owned railway company, can bid. The only people who can't bid to take on that contract are the people well, publicly I, owned who've been running it yeah, for five I, I, years. I now, that is ideology about I don't think we need to politics. run through every item in the Labour manifesto. Well, so, uh, I use it as an illustration. Yeah. And, and I want to hear from you, and I've got another question. Well, um, I'd say a couple of things. I think, probably on balance, I'd agree that the, the views of the British public have remained pretty consistent over the last 20 years. The British public haven't 
gone off to the extremes themselves. Mm. Uh, but I think there are some elements of what was the sort of centrist consensus of our politics for so long that are being challenged now. They're the ones to do with openness, globalization, trade, and things like that. But so I don't think it's exactly where we were before. I think there are important parts of the debate that have changed. But, but that's the because we shifted. are a lot more open. That is because people's lives have been changed by but, Euro European integration, but all, by yeah. freedom of movement. And freedom of movement impacts different groups very differently. But all those, yeah, okay. Well, all those things that Anand's just mentioned, you know, trade, globalization, all that, those are precisely the, the grounds, the issues upon which in the United States, Donald Trump appealed to so many angry, pissed off people. Yep. So address this panel, anger. How much of a factor in the United Kingdom today and in our political realignment, if that's what we are seeing, is just out and out anger? from a lot of people in this country? Or are we not angry in the same way so many disaffected, particularly white, working class people appear to be in America? Of course, we're in no way as angry as uh, America is. And I think that's a very sensible and, 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 and good way to be. I mean, but look at, I, I keep- We're not, we're not hacked off in this country. I think country. We're, we're mildly perturbed. <laughs> that's where I would just put it. True. But look at, True. I mean, I think that, you know, I have- That is so British. That is yeah. British. <laughs> That's what we do. Uh, but, you know, when you were talking really about centrism, I think it's one of those fascinating things. Because we watch a lot of American TV programs that are made on the coast, we use a lot of American tech that is made in San Francisco, we have a vision of what America is that is entirely incorrect. Mm. And actually, we are much more European than we ever know. But because very few of us speak another language, we don't realize. And look across Europe this year, you've had a series of centrist politicians winning. Angela Merkel looks likely to be returned in Germany, Macron in France. And I think that the difference with America is that you have got incredible poverty. I mean, it is a st statistic that astonishes me. There is no federally mandated maternity leave in America. So if you are a woman and you're pregnant and your job doesn't offer you any benefits, you have to use your holiday entitlement to have a baby. And that is something that if you tried to put that past British people, we'd go, <laughs> what? <laughs> and, and I think that's why you, you were talking about... You know, Angus Dayton, who won the Nobel Prize for this great research on deaths of despair, the fact that life expectancy is actually going down among white working class people because of things like the opioid epidemic, because of things like heart disease rates and obesity that is not being treated. You know, people are living really, really troubled lives in America that actually with the European social security and welfare net, we actually find quite difficult to imagine. Yeah. And those are not the so, people on our TV. Okay, so that's so, not the so, America we think of. Uh, so uh, those who characterize Brexit as a howl of anger from people, you know, say, just for argument's sake, in Middlesbrough or Hull or Boston, Lincolnshire or wherever, they're, they're talking nonsense, are they? It, isn't really, it wasn't really driven by well, anger. Well, I'm going to upset David by saying this, but the one of funny things about Brexit is there's a howl of anger from people whose lives are actually pretty good. Uh, if you're talking about the over 65s, I mean, certainly in terms of what their children can expect, I think that's one of the biggest, for me, and most difficult questions in British politics, is why is a generation whose living standards are so much better than they expected when they were young, so angry? And they well, are angry. They are. Well, there are well, well, we, we, we are in the richest part of the country in West London. But I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, mild perturbation <laughs> does become slightly more extreme perturbation, if that's the right concept, for the further north, in parts of the Midlands and parts of the north. Um, and I've, you know, I mean, th th this extraordinary question that, that pe people are asked, this opinion survey question, people, uh, it is suggested to people, it is rather a leading question, I admit, that, that, that a lot of people say Britain has changed in recent times, many people feel like it's become a foreign country. Something like 63% of the public agree with that. I mean, it's astonishing in a country, you know, as rich and successful and basically stable as ours, there are a lot of people who do think Society has changed far too fast, and not in not in a way that that, that is consistent with their interests. That you know, uh, uh, people are not you know this whole kind of open v closed thing. It's a very self-serving way of saying, oh, we've moved on from left v right. It's now open v closed. I've never met anyone who wants to live in a closed society. No, people don't want to live in a closed. Society. They just think the forms of openness we've developed in the, in the recent decades have not been working for them. I mean, like this the point I wanted to make about freedom of movement. If you're a North London lawyer, you know, you, you, you can go and work in your, your firm's Berlin office. You don't even have to, you know, sign a, any sort of um, documentation. You just go and do it and live there for two or three years. It makes your life better. If you work in the food production sector in Britain, it's our biggest sector by employment, biggest manufacturing sector by employment, employs 400,000 people. 120,000 of those people come from Central and Eastern Europe just since 2004. 
Now, you know, and most of the people who work in those factories are not host personally hostile to the people from Poland or Slovakia, but they think, you know, there is, it's, it'll, 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 it'll depress their wages and there will be more competition for social housing and public services in those areas. And, and people didn't have an opportunity to, 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 to complain about that because, all the, because there, was, uh, there was a party consensus on European membership and, 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 the, and, and the Labour Party was, was, was not complaining about it. Nobody was doing anything about it. So a lot of those two or three million people who had stopped voting because they thought all the parties are the same, and they were partly right about that, came out and voted Brexit. They were mildly perturbed, perhaps a bit more than mildly yeah, perturbed. Yeah. But this is what I slightly uh, struggle with, is the idea that some, form, some people's anger is more legitimate than others. So I agree that those people do have legitimate causes of concern, but if you're married to an EU national, for example, and you're now facing years of limbo, I don't feel that we somehow, don't intuitively feel that that anger is as legitimate. That's sort of seen as a feat Ramona kind of metropolitan liberal angst. But those, uh, they, I mean, those are absolutely it, people whose lives uh, are now in jeopardy. I'm not uh, saying that, any, but we're, we're talking about a tiny number of people in that case. I mean, it's just quantities of people. And, and I want to hear you on well, this, and then I've got another question. Well, firstly, I agree absolutely with Helen. I think that the, the levels of, of poverty and the levels of division in this country are nowhere near as severe as they are in the United States, whether it be socioeconomic or race, actually. I think America mm -hmm. is a different category altogether. What I would say, though, with the Brexit vote is you have two sorts of people. You have the comfortable 65-year-olds, the Shire Tories, who are relatively well-off, who are you know, voting for the past or voting against immigration, whatever it was. But then you have the sort of the Labour leave voters, and I think there was anger there, and I don't think it was all wholly immigration. I think immigration in many senses was a cipher. There was a growing sense that our communities have been forgotten by politics. That anger, I mean, who could be a worse salesman of the referendum to those communities than George Osborne, who stands up and says, things are great now, you wouldn't want to change them, would you? And the resounding answer is uh, yes, well, actually. Frankly, things are outstandingly uh, great for George Osborne. But, He's got well, about yes. 10 jobs, but... Uh, <laughs> but we let our country get to the point where 17 million people, a large proportion of the Leave voters, were willing to take a punt because they didn't like where we'd got to. And that's an indictment of where we'd got to as much as anything else. I, I, I mean, I agree with that. It was about both Europe and other things. So you know, communities have seen profound change. The old industries have gone. The levels of employment are not there. The kind of secure jobs paying a good wages. And I would sum it up like this. Uh, the, many of my constituents who wouldn't vote in a general election came out to vote in the mm. referendum because mm. they saw this as an opportunity to influence what happens. Mm. And they would sum it up by saying, we don't like the way things are. We don't think it's working for us. We didn't think you were listening. And the moment the result was declared, they'd have looked all of us in the eye and said, you're listening now, aren't you? And for them, it was a moment where they were able to exercise... Uh, that political power. And that is the challenge that our politics has got, both to respond to that, because somehow we have to bring the 52% and the 48% back together to fashion a new future in the light of the referendum uh, result. Which, just very quickly, which is why I think if we don't see a big shift in public opinion over the next 18 months, the notion that we should somehow stay in despite this anger would be fatal to our politics, because all those people who were saying, you're not listening, right. So, It'll be reaffirmed to them. And it'll make their anger much deeper. Yeah, yes. All right, uh, but, but hang on. So, because so, I want to get uh, audience questions very soon, but I've got a couple more of my own. Uh, I'm going to put it crudely. Do you think the next uh, year and more of, uh, you know, to do about Brexit could bust both these main political parties? Ironically, as somebody pointed out earlier, they got, you know, both of them over, well over 40% of the vote in the last election. But because they're so, both of them, so cripplingly divided on the Brexit issue, could Brexit bust these parties? Well, the great thing whenever I'm asked to forecast what's going to happen <coughs> over the next, uh, it's been now in Christmas, over the next 18 months, uh, I always uh, quite genuinely say anybody who claims to be able to answer that question for certain is fooling himself or herself and everybody else. Uh, the extraordinary uncertainty that all this has created is quite impossible. There is no one in control of events in Westminster or anywhere else uh, uh, and, or in either party and we just don't know where we're going. Uh, and so, <laughs> that is so it, it, it is so completely reassuring from the father of the house. Not at all house. reassuring. <laughs> and I, I think we were getting a bit uh, members of the Liberal elite when we were denying the level of anger and 
right. actually hostility to the really? political system and so on that mm. recent votes have represented. And I, what I do think, of course, is it's extremely important to get back in control of it. But someone has got to emerge who is capable of articulating a sensible case for globalization, for the pace of change which the elderly don't like anymore, for addressing some of the underlying problems which mean that many, many people don't think that they have benefited from the otherwise prosperous years of the last 20 years, and they think fear their children are going to benefit even less. All things we've touched on, I try to avoid the partisan way of addressing it, but we've got a very short time in which to try to win back confidence in a sensible political system, and at the moment, particularly when you go to some of the places that we've already mentioned, it is anger, it's not rioting anger, they aren't disorderly people, but inwardly, they but, want to express their rage at the political system. But, Ken, but, just one small point. It's not that they don't think they've benefited. They haven't benefited. I mean, this isn't a perception. This is reality, is that some people just haven't done very well at all. In fact, have done badly out of what, to us, might have seemed like a glorious period of globalised growth. Some have. That, 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 yeah, but, I, I, but, but, I mean, we have aired the, the, the structural issues about globalisation and who's benefited, who hasn't, to some extent. But I, I now wanted to turn to whether party politics is going to fundamentally change. I mean, if I may say so, and I don't wish to be rude or question either of yours political integrity, but, but you, even in the words you've said tonight, are so out of tune with your own party that I wonder what it would take for you to actually bugger off and leave it. Uh, well, um, I mean, I am a centre-right, free market, the social conscience. What is the, no, I, know, I believe but, in the two-party system. If it, this particular issue, there's a, it's not, I'm not revealing some great secret. Uh, and it's, it's really rather comic to see the leaders of the two parties trying to reveal the equally obvious position across both their parties. I do not agree with John <laughs> Redwood uh, on the European no, Union. but Ken, my point is... I never have agreed with John Redwood. This isn't like Redwood a, a piddling the, argument the about... Union. about I mean, even a no, serious so thing like grammar schools. This is like existential to the entire future of the nation. Well, I you keep are... arguing for a cross-party approach in Parliament because it seems to me the pretense that the two front benches have to go through, that they've suddenly come up with some new unifying position, which if it is genuinely unifying, is so usually so vague and, uh, and ambiguous that they manage to get everybody inside it. But what we actually do is to need but, to do is actually organise in a hung Parliament hung parliament politics that can produce some but consensus. That, so Hillary and I in our speeches uh, are agreeing half the time. Now, there are plenty of other things we can yeah, disagree but, but, on. But, but uh, 75% of our audience tonight feel politically homeless. And not so long ago, before the shock of the last election, there were a lot of people, and you know, people around Tony Blair and George Osborne and Nick Clegg and da-da-da, all talking about you know, the very urgent need to start thinking about a new political movement. The election sort of killed a lot of that, but maybe Britain, you know, and, and all of the homeless people in here tonight, politically homeless people, want <laughs> some serious talk about a new but political sure, movement. The Labour Party is much more fragile than the Conservative Party on this, but partly because the Labour Party's voter base is absolutely split, has, has, has different interests. <laughs> I mean, it has both the most zealous supporters and the great beneficiaries of, of so many of the changes of the last generation or so, the massive increase in higher education, the much greater openness, uh, the European Union, you know, or, or, or the university seats that were overwhelmingly pro-Labour. And on the other hand, you've still got you know, the, the left-behind parts of the country, the deindustrialized parts of the country, which feel they're not part of the national story any longer. And, and some of those, a lot of those actually moved to the Tories, and I think will continue to do so. They didn't do so in the numbers that required for the Tories to get a, to, to, to get a landslide. But um, that, that, that is Labour's problem. It, it, it's not just that they're, they're different sort of social Except, types. But, but, they have but, but, conflicting but, but, interests on the great I issues of the day. All Western democracies are in the same mess. Well, the other Europeans are the same. We've, they, they've all got five-star yeah, movement, Podemos, well, exactly. and the alternative the, for Deutschland, yeah. uh, and the established party system, the old idea of big establishment parties that every now and again change in office when one of them's made mm, a mess but, and it's yeah. the other one's turn to take over. That's dead But Ken, everywhere. this has and particularly worth, happened to the centre it's, it's in the worth, Netherlands, in it France. is worse for yeah. the social democrats because yeah. the blue-collar industrial working class and their families that produced a massive 
loyal vote yeah. for the Labour Party in this country is much smaller than it was, and the older ones have gone off to the right. They're socially conservative. And it, this isn't only the Labour Party. I mean, we have problems as well with our political base. Uh, and I'm trying not to be partisan this evening. But the, 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 for the Labour Party, it's particularly difficult. Their supporters polarised to extremely right-wing, very nationalist, anti-foreigner, ageing white working-class people in the North, and really very modernizing, uh, very internationalist, uh, very relaxed about a cosmopolitan, multiracial, yes. multicultural uh, society who support them in the South and Southeast. Labour voters you know, in London do not resemble well, Labour let, voters hear, in Hartlepool. Let's hear some other views on that. I'm fascinated by your view on this. I mean, did you ever consider in your darkest moments when you resigned from the shadow cabinet... I was actually sacked, but anyway. Oh, yes, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> in the interest of accuracy. <laughs> that, yeah, you're right, silly me. Unsurprisingly, You were anyway, fired unceremoniously. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, you were fired. Did I ever and, consider what? And you had no confidence in your leader and da-da-da-da-da. Well, did you consider talking to these voices around Blair and others and seriously thinking about getting on board with something else? No. Uh, you could say I was sort of born into the Labour Party. I um, but intend that's to... not Hang on, that's hang on. That's... I'm answering your question. If you just give me a second, Stephen. Ah. I intend to die in the Labour Party, but not just yet. Now, <laughs> to come back uh, controversially again to the question you asked, is Brexit going to bust British politics? I'm much less worried about that than I am a bad Brexit busting uh, the British economy and our future as a nation. And the biggest single challenge that we have got <laughs> is, is to try and bridge the divide. Now, the, the way that I would put it to my Leave voters, I would say, I respect the outcome of the referendum. I campaigned to remain. I lost. I'm a Democrat. We're leaving the European Union, the institutions. But what the referendum result did not determine, and this is the issue for today, is what our future relationship is going to be with our friends and neighbours. And that is where trade and market access and cooperation on security and foreign policy and data and health and indeed the movement of workers uh, rests. And I think the problem that we've got, it's taken the government a very, very long time, and it is a, it's a partisan point, to move from the nonsense we could leave with no deal, to say that there would not need to be transitional arrangements. It's been painful, we've wasted time, there is still a risk it will uh, go wrong. And I'm reading the words above us for inspiration. I would love to think about Brexit when there would be no more sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. But that is only going to come to pass if the majority that there is in the current House of Commons is able to say to the government, these are the things that you now have to do. And it is plain as a pike staff that we are not going to negotiate this all singing, all dancing, bespoke Brexit deal by October next year. We're going to have to have transitional arrangements. And as Keir Starmer very clearly set out in the summer, that is going to involve staying for a transitional period in the single market and a customs all right. union. All right. Well, I, I want to hear from Helen and Anna, Anna and you and then Helen on this. And, and, and I, you, you're right. You answered my question, the previous question. I'd, I'd overtaken you. I'd asked another one since then. I mean, I asked about whether Brexit's going to bust British politics. And then I moved on to asking whether there was, whether Brexit could be the motor for a breakup of the two-party system, you know, for a new movement. Call it a party, call it what you will, but a new movement that Brexit might bring to the fore. But uh, take either of those points, Anand. Well, on, you... the, on, the, on the second point, I think creating a new third party at a moment when the big two parties have swept up 80% of the vote strikes me as odd. So that's weird. Without, yeah, that I, motion I, is I just dead. don't see a future in that. But I actually do think... The, the current debate about Brexit is far less of a problem for Labour than it is about the Tories. I absolutely agree that when we were discussing in or out, Brexit or non-Brexit, it was a real problem for the Labour Party for the reasons you gave. But I think the problem that the Conservatives have is that Ken's headbangers are committed to a path that is going to cause irreparable economic damage. And Labour doesn't have a grouping that's committed to self economic self-harm. It has a grouping that's committed to leaving, but they're more open, I think, to softer forms of Brexit. And I think there, actually, the line that Labour have come up with, whether through good luck or good management, which is, we want a Brexit that preserves our economy, is actually a pretty coherent one, because it points in a certain direction. The majority in both parties 
a favour of a soft Brexit, if you're talking about the parliamentarians, yeah. uh, Hillary and I are entirely agreed, and it's not a revelation, we both made speeches in the House of Commons, but even outside saying the same things, he's just said it. But then we need a long know. transitional period, and we should stay in the single market, the customs union mean well. The great majority of MPs agree with that, but, you have the but neither party agrees with that. Well, no, the official that's, position that's of each so party is against that, and both the leaders are and against that. And that's why so many people feel so yeah. homeless. But the history of, the history of new parties is, 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 is catastrophic. Everybody's been so, cured of that by the history of the SDP, yeah. and I particularly agree that this would be a singularly inauspicious time for suddenly, uh, you know, former Blairites and One Nation Tories to suddenly start talking about forming so, uh, a party with what's left of the Liberal Democrats. It's, it's, a, it's a popular thing to put in newspapers, but I think most <laughs> practicing politicians th think that's so, an Helen, easy way to go even further into uh, oblivion. Well, you know, I'm just crippled by a, a sense of futility here. You're saying, oh, Hillary and I, we represent the clear majority in the House of Commons and we're all sensible and we know how to navigate a path through this Brexit mess and save the country. But frankly, you may know that to be the case, but it's, it's just not happening and there's no sign of it's ever going to happen over the next 18 months. So, Helen, how... how the optimistic, I, I the on optimistic the contrary, side of me is it will happen because yeah, I don't yeah. think there's any practical alternative. We, just in the last the few weeks, we've seen, we've seen a, 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 an emerging consensus which actually crosses both parties about not being absolutely hardline on the European Court of Justice. We're moving towards a fuzzy Brexit, but what we're well, forgetting yeah, is but, that there is um, another side to this negotiation. I mean, my fear is the EU are going to screw this up. Yeah, all I mean, right. But because they have screwed up Helen pretty well everything since the mid-1990s. The euro, help. you know, the refugee crisis. You know, uh, and they're actually doing pretty badly so far in this negotiation. They've come up with a sequencing thing that we agreed to, but actually it doesn't make sense because we can't know how much we're going to pay uh, in the bill until we know what right. the trading relationship is yeah, going to be and things that. like that. I think no, the no, EU no, are handling uh, this a lot better than we are on the basis that they've been had years and years of practicing it and yeah. we've got kind well, of no, six no civil servants before. that we've rustled up from a cupboard somewhere and forced to try and have a go at it. But I, I, to, in terms of a new political party, yeah. I would never rule that out. I think Ken's right. If you, you know, how many times have I sat and predicted something that wildly failed to come to pass? Did you feel year? in your waters it might be happening? You know, in the months before the election. Yeah, I did, and there was a reason for that. Is that, that we had a lot of discussions. Uh, people I talked to about what was Labour's flaw. You know, what was the absolute baseline of what Labour could go down to? And people were saying maybe, you know, 20%. And actually, if you look at those local election results from the 4th of May, mm. Labour on 28%. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the things. Um, of all the things that have been busted about you know, conventional political wisdom, the idea that campaigns don't matter is the biggest casualty <laughs> of this year. So the idea was that if, you know, you just went in with your performance six months out, it was all decided. That was not true this year. So, yeah, there was pretty serious conversations, as I understand it, happening about a new party. The reason I wouldn't rule it out is because of Emmanuel Macron in France. Now, that's right. a very different system to the one that we have here. But I still think if you had somebody, and no shade to any of the politicians present, but I don't feel that people are wildly inspired by any of the politicians that they see around them, right? I don't think people look at Theresa May and think... <laughs> Even if they voted Tory, I don't think there is no Blair-style wave behind Theresa May. Maybe there is a bit behind Jeremy Corbyn, you might say, among a particular segment of people. Mm. So if somebody came out, you know, the only person I can think of yeah, really that think it would, of a be, name for me. would be if somebody like Ruth Davidson said, I don't want to be in a party that has just done a deal with a very homophobic DUP and I'm going to start my own party. Somebody who like that who has that kind of unique brand that is both appealing to working class conservatives and also to metropolitan liberals, mm. that's the kind of person I can see breaking out. But as Ken says, the problem is everybody remembers where are the, what do the Lib Dems poll in this election? 8%? And like you see, you talk to Lib Dems now and they go, all these people say to me that they want a liberal pro-European party. And I think, that's us. Why doesn't anyone love us? <laughs> and that's the problem for a third party. You know, Angela Merkel famously said about coalitions, the little party always gets crushed. Yep. And that is yep. exactly that the is story true. of British politics. But today. Helen, the thing about Macron surely is, I mean, talented though he is, he only won because the socialists collapsed and Fillon had a court case about corruption. I mean, it took, it took implosions on left and right for a centrist party to emerge. And we've got the opposite here. We've got a renaissance of the two big parties. So where's the, where's the space? It's because he was anti-establishment. He's back to this uh, angry protest again. 
the, at, at which it's Corbyn got it. Right. It wasn't Corbyn's policies. It wasn't the policies of the manifesto. Only one voter in a thousand had a clue what the Labour Party's policies were. It was, and I'd say... That, you're, you're, there's but, roughly a thousand people but, in but this what, hall. What, 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 you're what? saying that only <laughs> one of us had any clue. I think that's right. I mean, <laughs> Hillary was explaining... Hillary was I've explaining never been so insulted in my life. He'd been involved in, and I, it was revelation to me, some of the things he was saying. <laughs> uh, the, the, Corbyn did actually manage to capture some of the anti-establishment quality. Corbyn, one thing he persuaded people in, in an awful election campaign, where the public was still switched off, was who he wasn't one of those politicians. Mm -hmm. When they were told that 600 times he'd voted against his own parties, that was a very good thing. When he was on a platform, he was an ordinary chap talking, and he obviously uh, wasn't a politician. Mm -hmm. He was the Bernie Saunders protest vote here, whereas the, you know, the, 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 we've seen the Donald Trump vote in, in the referendum campaign. All right. Uh, and and well, so, but it, well, none of this makes it easy to form this new, all singing, all dancing centrist party, which Tony Blair used to do. But he said Corbyn, it's an unrepeatable success. I mean, all of those Tories in Kensington, just up the road from here, are not going to vote Labour next time. <laughs> Are they? I really I mean, wouldn't be so sure. I mean, I yeah. think that the, the t assumption that you have to test is can Labour win by default? That's always something we thought. Labour faces an uphill struggle. And I just think if you think about the fact that public sector workers have faced a real terms pay cut over the last 10 years, you know, look at the economy, which is always what drives elections, and think about the fact that the pound is now so weak, you know, people feel poorer. Do we really think that people are going to go into the next election thinking, I'm really happy with everything, and I'm, I, I'm just happy just to keep it ticking mm. over like this? I think the Labour, whether or not they deserve it, is another point, and whether or not people agree with the policies mm. is a completely different point. But if you're going to talk about these great big populist revolts, why would you bet against there being one that puts Jeremy Corbyn mm. in number 10? I, I would not. Very interesting but, point. Now, OK, so uh, we have reached that moment, ladies and gentlemen, where I'm going to shut up, and you'll all be delighted to hear that. And I want questions from the floor and I suspect there are going to be lots of them. The only thing you have to forgive is that there are very fierce lights, so it's a little bit difficult to see hands. But what I'm going to do is take a, a bunch of two or three at a time from different areas of the hall. So um, trying to see what I'm doing. Uh, if, if we go, number three is a microphone. So if we take a couple of questions from that area where the gentleman's got the microphone. You go first, sir. Yeah. In 2012, a Maury poll of the country asking about grievances and worries, people spontaneously talked about all the things that David's got in his book, all those somewhere people grievances, mm -hmm. like immigration, like access to public services, and all that stuff. But they didn't talk about Europe. Europe was down the bottom of those spontaneous concerns. Right. How... Does the panel think, over that period, Europe was moved into centre stage as the proxy for all those legitimate grievances? You know, it's the question of agency, or as Helen would say, campaigns. How was that done? Okay, uh, thank you. Let, let's take at least one more from your area of the hall. Uh, can we get the mic to that gentleman? Yes. Right there. Go on, sir. You're going to get the mic in a moment. Give us your question. Pithy as possible, please. Hello. Um, the key to a centrist party is its leader. If you have a good leader, it's got a chance. If you have a bad leader, not a hope in hell. Mm. I personally believe there is only one possible leader, because mm. I can't think of anybody else. I'm greatly in favour, and he is David Miliband. What does the panel think? Ah. I thought you were going to say Tony Blair, then. Uh, David Miliband's not in the hall tonight, is he? No, no, no. He was laughing. <laughs> uh, all right, let's take these two in order. First question, how come, how is it that, that Europe became the proxy for all of these feelings of alienation and pissed offness that, that people were feeling before, but actually weren't, they weren't that bothered about Europe, they were alienated about a whole lot of stuff, and David's written about plenty of it, but Europe wasn't anywhere near the top of their list of problems, and, and suddenly, you know, Europe has become the proxy for all this. How come? Well, it's very... I mean, if you look at those Ipsos Mori trackers, they're really interesting, because, as you rightly say, Europe never figured near the, list, near the top of people's concerns. Even immediately before the referendum on those trackers, Europe wasn't there. 
The trackers that were done around the last election were very interesting because Brexit came top. And immigration, for the first time in God knows how many years, didn't figure on the list. So it's precisely that phenomenon of being a proxy. Brexit has boxed up a load of concerns that people have. And they're not going to be solved by Brexit because there are so many conflicting ones, you know. Uh, and Brexit has become a cipher for those things. And it became a cipher for those things because Brexit post-referendum was the only story in town. I mean, we've heard nothing but Brexit, have we, since the referendum? But we love a bit of blame. Who are we blaming for all this? For... Well, we for allowing blame. Brexit to become this proxy for so much else and, and, and arguably to many in the country doing the country a disservice Nigel in the process. Farage. Well, well, Nigel Farage, who is an extraordinary politician, whether you agree with him or not, he, he, took, uh, a, you know, he took all of the BMPs or voters, he took a big chunk of old Conservative voters, he melded it together, he spoke to people in a language that they felt they understood, he was incredibly yeah. good on TV, he was, he was given oh. enormous airtime to air his views, and as you can see from UKIP afterwards, no one else has m matched that success. I think you just have to say that without him, Brexit would not very have happened. Very interesting. And he was and the one who realised, he, he was the one who realised he made a proxy. I mean, the, the reason it is a very successful proxy and attracts all these votes and did in the, the referendum is, firstly, it is simple. Mm. And uh, uh, Hillary Benn in America, and a lot of politicians here, switch people off. They're just dismissed as policy wonks because they talk about extremely complicated questions. And these protesting voters don't want that. They want someone to simplify it. No, it's You're the quite politics right. of emotion. They want scapegoats. The yeah. simple solution they want is, you tell me who's to blame. And if you can say, grey men in Brussels, Jean-Claude Juncker, who you now frighten your children with when they go to bed, <laughs> uh, and, and, and all these foreigners John Redwood frightens them That's with That's why you're Clark. worse off. <laughs> uh, that, that, and Farage realised that. He, he linked immigration with yeah. Europe yeah. and found it worked. He never went on about Polish plumbers much. He appeared in front of posters that had Muslim Middle Eastern refugees on an Eastern European border and never explained that whether these people could ever come to settle in this country if they wanted to had absolutely nothing to do with our membership of the European Union. We were a sovereign state right, well, who made that decision. Pen, but that. he brilliantly mobilised this protest panel, and said, he used thanks. the simple answer. Let's panel, leave it all uh, panel, 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 panel. Just as I said, questions have to be pithy, answers have to be pithy too. So. David Cameron. David Cameron. Oh, because oh. I, I agree <laughs> with what his share of the credit, the blame, should not disappear in this discussion because Nigel Farage created a force that started to take votes in truth from both of our parties. And in the end, David Cameron reached the conclusion, and this, this is why, that he couldn't manage the problems in his own party. And so he looked back to what Harold Wilson had done 40 or so years previously when the Labour Party was split on membership of the common market and he drew exactly on a renegotiation and referendum thinking he would win and when you ask the question then you may get the answer that you don't like. So it was his decision fundamentally to hold the referendum. Right, well... Let, There's a reason why let's not get too hung up on, on that, although it is interesting. Well, well, but, but, it was the, but it became about control, didn't it? I mean, you know, taking back control was a very, very powerful slogan because this, you know, there is a positive reason for voting Brexit. It is about self-government, that feeling that Brussels had come to represent the technocratic state, all of those things that keep being taken out of the democratic conflict. You know, the Bank of England becomes independent. We have all this judicial activism. So many decisions are now taken outside of the democratic conflict and Brussels was the was the example of that par excellence people wanted self-government and national right, sovereignty I'm again. taking back control at this point because uh, <laughs> very briefly I want and, and I want uh, you to answer the second question our questioner said you know in his view the key to a centrist party is finding the right credible leader and he says he can think of only one David Miliband are you with him or against him well, I don't suppose my opinion of David Miliband is of interest. No, I didn't mean against Miliband, but, uh, I meant against the question no, of view. I think, I think the leader is one of the issues. I think there are other ones as well. I think there is the state of the two parties, and as I said at the moment, they are in a very rude health, so I think it's the wrong moment. And there is an electoral system that directly Absolutely. pushes you towards a two-party system. Yeah. And I think for those two reasons, regardless of who's in charge, it is not a great moment to try no, and create uh, a and new so Hillary, party. if David Miliband uh, issued the most emotional rallying cry possible for you to join a, his movement, a sort of Macron-Miliband movement, how would you respond? I, I'm, I gave you the answer earlier. I'm well, Labour through and through and I'm not going anywhere else. 
David Miliband is not Macron <laughs> uh, or any of this. He's also got a very good, <laughs> but, an important although, job in although, New York. Although so. the leader's important, this is yeah. game is escaping from all these complicated issues, and it's a simple solution. Exactly. Leader does matter, you know. And it, it, when my party, I've said it, got reported picked up somewhere when I said it somewhere else. When they can't think of anything to do, we have a leadership contest. You know, it, 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 it's, uh, <laughs> and there's a section of the public that want the simple solution. When they're not just finding scapegoats, there, there they want to choose a new leader rather like choosing who wins strictly come down. And just very briefly, about, but there, there, there is the another David. I, I, thought the, the, I thought the questioner might have suggested David Owen. He is a bit old now, it's true. But, I mean, David Owen represents, you know, in, a, in a way that you were saying that... that um, that the Scottish Ruth does, that kind of uh, that potentially that hard centre, the ability to bring these value groups together. Well, and he was the, he was the right, one well, British politician who had always argued in favour of a looser outer out room. Enough, panel, yeah. enough, He's enough, enough. I, I want more before. questions. Go. Uh, <laughs> let, let's go to the back, and on this side, we've got the, the number four microphone. So let's hoover up some questions uh, in that area. So uh, we've got, yeah, let's take three at once, but keep them really short, and I'll try and keep the panel short too. Go on. Um, in terms of um, talking about the divide between young and old, um, I think we've got to kind of recognise that whether or not it's specifically related to uh, Brexit in terms of identity, whether people voted remain or leave, or kind of as a result of Brexit, the, the other things that are being ignored, how do young people who have kind of um, grown up with this... Um, kind of got to this point with this open and um, kind of the, the way that we have been since 97, yeah. just, you know, uh, as, as a kind of pinpoint. How do we kind of have our say? Because I feel like it, a little bit, it's kind of been passed over and actually the fact that young people are going to be the ones who actually come in as Brexit is, is having an effect. Um, how do young people feel like they can actually have a proper say and that actually the, yeah. their, their identity, the fact that actually identity is an important issue, in fact, that you might feel like, personally I feel like a bit of my identity has been taken away from me, whether or not that emotionally is recognised or not. How can we kind of yeah, got take you. that into consideration? Okay, I'll get that one out to the panel. Uh, can we bring the microphone down a bit? to a gentleman waving his arm right there. It was one of the sort of flag staffs of the Brexit campaign that we'd take back control. Usually one assumed that would be through our parliament. How can one have any confidence in where we're going when A, we don't seem to be understanding our own constitution and B, in parliament right now, we're trying to reverse matters that seem to have come to a head by the execution of Charles I. We're going back further to Henry VIII, trying to use powers that we fought kings to wrest from them. It's absolutely crazy, and we don't know where we're going. Would you agree? All right. There's nothing like a non-prejudicial question. That's wonderful. Uh, one more for the, the, the gentleman who's nearest you, there. Then we, we don't worry, we're going to come to other areas of the hall, but we're going to stick with that area for now. Yeah, go on, sir. Well, I want to make, uh, make an observation. I recollect 20 years ago that... Can you turn it into a question? Because then... Yeah. Well, 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 I want to make an observation, first of all, which is that, <laughs> which is, which is that we're all as confused as you are. 20 years ago, I remember education, the armed forces, healthcare, security being the major issues. And now we have so many important issues, uh, notwithstanding all of those, including global warming, Scottish independence, war in other countries. And it's very difficult to identify which are the primary issues because our identity, our choice of politics, how does one prioritize which of those issues is the most important? And I don't think our politicians are giving us a clear lead on which of those very mm. many more important issues uh, we should choose to be the most important. And that's what I'm confused about. Okay, yeah, yeah, all right. Good, well, we've got three here, so let's chew these over without further ado. Um, we had a, a, a young person in the audience saying, um, how do young people who are, you know, have grown up in a relatively open Britain, if we can use that phrase, David, mm -hmm. uh, how can they have a proper say in the current debate when, when so many feel that what is happening is robbing them of, of a bit of their identity? Well, I would say there are two things that you can do, and that's vote and buy newspapers. 
And that's a very partisan thing for me to say as a member of the media, but we saw youth turnout was up at this election, and that's yeah. one of the reasons why the, the result was as it was. But the classic thing has always been that old people will vote. The yeah. over 65s will get out to the polling days, so that shifts the electoral incentive so far in their favour. That's why you end up with things like the triple lock on pensions. You know, pensions going up by the rate of inflation at the time when wages for working people aren't. And the second thing in terms of buying newspapers, the Daily Mail, whatever you think about it, advocates incredibly hard and incredibly well for the constituency it represents. Where is the equivalent that does that for 18 to 24-year-olds in our public life? It does not exist. And you have to, unfortunately, as you know, the trade union movement proved, if you care about something, you have to put time and you have to put money into it. And young people need to have those kind of lobbying organisations that feel dependent on them. And the only way you can do that, unfortunately, is, is with money. And putting your money where, you know, into things like momentum or whatever it is, or young conservatives, if such a thing still exists. Um, you know, you, you, have to, you have to get involved. You have to give up time and energy and, and ultimately sacrifice some portion of your wages to it. That's it. OK. Anybody? Uh, uh, one, I'll uh, allow uh, one more. Anand, and uh, you well, on I'd, I'd say two things. I'd say, yeah, absolutely vote. And I think one of the things we'll see at the next election is that our parties take young people seriously now, yeah. and they will figure in the election because it suddenly dawned on us that they vote. But we've got an old population. So you can't blame young people for this. I mean, the fact is that you'd have needed, I think it's 120% turnout amongst under 25s to turn the Brexit vote round. You'd have needed a 97% turnout over, of under 40s to turn the referendum result around. The fact is, we're an ageing society. So partly, young people have got the thin end of the wedge just demographically. But, but, but yeah. can I just... I mean, I do think there is also a bit of a myth here that you, so somehow everyone under 25 is going to be imprisoned in the UK for the next 50 years. <laughs> I mean, I've heard Vince Cable more or less saying this on, on radio. Actually, relatively little is going to change in terms of openness. We're going to continue to have visa-free travel. The, the Erasmus... Are we? Yes, we are. Well, that's, that's certainly what the British government wants. We are, yeah, we're, well, the Erasmus system oh. will continue. <laughs> oh, that's all right, then. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there is a massive interest for on both sides, you know, the tourist industry uh, you know, in, in both Europe and, and Britain has a massive interest in visa-free travel, and we, we, we will one way or another get it. Uh, the Erasmus <laughs> system, universities, will con you, you will still be able to go uh, to, you know, to, to do a year at a European university if you want to. Anyway, and about, only about half of the current uh, exchanges go through Erasmus anyway. Um, you know, life right, will yeah, not on. change think, uh, that much yeah, for young enough. people in relation to Europe. Enough. Can, can I come to the second question, which was you about can. the EU withdrawal bill, I think you were referring to. Now, uh, Henry VIII in 1539, I suppose, I think he was in between wives at the time uh, when he issued his, his proclamation. But you cannot look at the terms of the EU withdrawal bill that we've been debating over the past couple of days and square that with a ringing declaration that we are taking back control. Um, and which is why the bill is going to have to be significantly amended during its course through Parliament. To answer the last question... Oh, blame me. You're, you're really getting well, ahead right. of yourself. But, yeah, well, go, go okay. on. Yeah, quick, go on. Yeah. Well, that's very kind of you. <laughs> uh, but since the gentleman asked it, well, I know, what is but... the biggest challenge that we face as a world? It is how are we going to deal with the increasing interdependence of human beings? By the time my grandchildren are my age, they'll be living on this planet with 10 billion fellow citizens. And what the referendum result demonstrated is we are struggling to find the right balance between influence at home, dealing with the problems that we can identify, and coming to terms with the absolute necessity for international cooperation to make sure that we are able to live interdependently in, in peace and security. Did you say 10 billion fellow citizens? In, fellow on the humans, planet. fellow humans, you mean? Yeah, I mean well, citizens, citizens are members of, the, uh, of a nation state. Citizens yeah. of According the, to Theresa uh, May, if you're a citizen, if you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. That's what Theresa May says. But I, I take your point. On, on the Henry VIII clause, when I, I abstained on the second reading of this bill, because I'm not going to support it until these amendments are brought forward, it needs to be changed. And I voted against the government on the timetable motion and so on. Uh, but the House is still full of people who won't do that because they pay deference to this blasted referendum, which uh, they all <laughs> say they've been instructed by the people and so on. Uh, and actually, it's a question of parliamentary accountability. Is Parliament going there's to a big, be... There's a bigger question. Parliament is much weaker now than it was when I first joined it. Parliament, and this has been a continuing 
process going on for some time. I do think Tony Blair had a lot to do with it. He, he took away the weapon of time from the opposition and from groups. He insisted that he was all dressed up as family-friendly hours. It was to make sure that they didn't talk too much about difficult things. The government had more control of the business, and the ministers all knew they had to come to vote for 10 minutes at 7 o'clock, then they could go away again. Uh, and unfortunately, over recent years, it's been developed. Yeah, but Ken, that's precisely why when you said earlier, oh, media, Hillary, and I, no. Hillary and I agree on so much, and I can assure you there's yes. a majority of MPs who are going to be sensible on Brexit, that's why I'm so, you know, well, I'm not convinced that, that matters. I, I, think, I think it will be amended, and I hope it will be a reversal of the process. The present minister is citing precedents from the Blair government uh, for these clauses. And if he's right. allowed to get away with what he does, future ministers from any party right. will cite what he's doing. The, 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 the bigger problem is Parliament... Be, the government is too controlled by newspapers. For younger people, it's not going to be newspapers. Best thing younger people could do to intervene in this, start organising some serious debate on the social media, which is the only source of political debate for the majority of people under the age of 50. At the moment, in an old fogey's opinion, it is prejudiced, it is silly, it's largely based on insults. Everybody confirms their own views by only exchanging them with people who agree with them. Once that becomes a developed debate and influences the next generation of people, well, politics will change. I think politics for a whole variety of reasons change for the better. Parliamentary power might be restored by this current mess over Brexit because we're not going to get anywhere unless the majority of the House of Commons who can broadly agree on what they want start coming together, start making the government right. do what is, in my opinion, in the national interest. I want one other panellist to... Uh, Hillary gave an impassioned response to this idea of, you know, what must the priorities be going forward? We we're all confused. It's not clear that, that there is a consensus politically on what the, the most important priorities for poli you know, UK politics to be wrestling with are right now. So, Anand, give me your sense of, you know, very short, your sense of what our top priorities ought to be. Not what, what they actually are, but what they ought to be. I think a priority for our politicians and of our system is that politics need to regain the trust of the people it governs. Uh, that has got to be front and centre of this, because actually from that comes everything else. From that comes inclusiveness. From that comes people's participation. At this moment, we're going through an odd moment in this country at the moment where you have like a surge in Labour Party membership or whatever, but there is still that lingering distrust of the people who govern us, and I think that should be a priority for those in Whitehall. Okay. Minnesota. I think we've got time for one more tranche of three questions. We haven't been in this central area down the front, so uh, conveniently we've got three very eager hands. So could we take these three questions? Right. I think the whole thing is unbelievably depressing. We have Ken Clark and Hilary Benn saying that there are a large majority of parliamentarians mm. who are thinking along the same lines. Are you surprised the public doesn't trust you or believe you? We were sold a whole lot of lies in the vote and you have, none of you have come up with any answer except to say eventually you'll come to your senses. How are you going to come to your senses? All right, okay. I asked for pithy and I got... I got pithy. Thank you, madam. Uh, I, but I did promise some people a bit further back. So uh, where's the microphone now? Can we go to... I, I promised that gentleman with the black shirt who's looking so pleading at me. There you go. Thank you very much. If it's true that in the run-up to Brexit, public confidence in politicians were at an all-time low, this nadir of confidence, and they're all crooks, does the panel think there's any relationship between that lack of confidence and the weakening of Parliament and how easy it was for those so-called leaders to package all these proxy concerns into the white van of Brexit. Where were the leaders? I mean, were Gove and Boris and Farage and Liam Fox, for God's sake, were they really the leaders leading us all into this? Is the whole thing not a crisis of leadership? Is the whole Brexit mess not symptomatic of a crisis of leadership? And what do the panel think we should do about right. it? Okay. Uh, right, well, one more from this, this sector. Uh, it's, it's, frankly, it's lucky dip. Whoever gets the mic first. Ma'am, you, I think you've, you've won the raffle. There you go. How might Machiavelli work his way out of this mess? Ah. Oh, I love questions like that, because I don't have to answer them, but somebody else does. Uh, good. All right. Um, 
first one, uh, I suppose this was primarily anger directed at Ken and Hillary for, you know... Yeah, well, because no, you, well, it's you, all part. I mean, you, you if, if, if I may come back, when in, are you lot in Parliament going to come to your senses? You are the only two no, representatives this is, this who are in This is all part Parliament. of this ridiculous senses denigration of the political process. It just shows the questioner shares this ridiculous adolescent <laughs> cynicism, which has been cultivated <laughs> over the last twenty years. Uh, in, in my experience, people who enter politics, by and large, are motivated by some clear views of national interest, and having worked in other areas areas of life, some in business, some in the law, I think the ethical standards of the average member of parliament are very much higher than those of the general public. That is an unfashionable hands, view. Uh, ever since about six or a dozen of them uh, started fiddling their expenses, which is a proportion of 650, is probably a lower proportion than in many leading businesses in this country, uh, including journalism. And the public are being swept along by some of this fashionable nonsense. Uh, and there is a genuine policy dilemma. The parliamentarians have to be allowed to start engaging with the extremely complex issues which weren't even addressed in the referendum. As you quite rightly say, the figures who took the public eye, the people who got in the national media debate, were taking ridiculous and sometimes quite dishonest points on both sides. The general public heard no debate about how we were going to leave. Most members of the member public aren't quite sure what we're talking about now on the single market and the customs union. Uh, I am told so, that so, I'm so. ordered by my constituents, by a result, my constituents voted remain, but I am told I'm ordered by the public opinion uh, to leave your atom. Now, most of the people I meet have no views on your <laughs> atom uh, <laughs> at all. But and parliament, parliament, it is an opportunity for Parliament to take back control, I don't know how it's going but to be done. But that's the point. But it's not it, held it, when the public just say, oh, well, it's all, you know, just give us a simple answer. It's all silly anyway. And you are obviously like me, a disappointed Remainer, so you think we should all agree just to go back to where we were. If we could do that, I'd be very happy. But in the real world, these things are more complicated <laughs> than that. And it's the politicians who are going to have to solve how, it. How do you have, or Hillary, or either of you who sit in the House of Commons, how is Parliament going to reassert its, its power over this process? You say, oh, so much of the debate was driven and influenced by people who weren't either necessarily parliamentarians or telling the truth. So how are these truth-telling parliamentarians, the sensible majority, going to reassert themselves? Well, we'll see how we get on in the committee stage of this bill, which is only a very preliminary uh, sort of you know, a sort of seed-setting thing, but it'll be a good experiment in seeing. I mean, if the government can just maintain a policy for whatever they've finally managed to agree on uh, the day before, uh, uh, by just calling on, I don't know, party loyalty or saying everybody's been instructed by the referendum, uh, I personally wish that people would stop paying deference to this referendum. It was held for cynical reasons. It was a dreadful campaign. People answered a broad brush question which contained hundreds of other questions simply because they were angry about something or other and often not because Perturbed. of Europe at all. And now I hear every angry. politician saying, I mean everybody, Hillary has to begin by saying, of course I respect democracy and the judgment well, of, well, the, of, of, the, of, the, of the people. Well, let's get well, to the second, I, point. What, the the, second the, point. There's no happen. judgment at all being exercised by the people on the many detailed things that are going to have to be negotiated for a new place in the world if All that's right. where we're going to go. Mm -hmm. Well, I do... I, at the risk of breaking the consensus, uh, I do respect the outcome of the referendum for the reason that we began discussing tonight. If Parliament, as we were urged, had decided not to vote in favour of the Article 50 legislation, then indeed the 52% would have turned round. And if you think we have a crisis of confidence in our politics tonight, which is the premise of our discussion, Believe you me, we would have a crisis of confidence in our politics. And Anna made the point earlier, because people would say, you're just treating us with contempt. You're telling us we didn't know what we were doing. And that is why we have to distinguish between the decision to leave the institutions, which is going to happen, and frankly, the answer to your question is the government coming to its senses. We are seeking to do our job by pointing out uh, that the, the path on which the government set out was never going to be sustainable. I mean, the amount of effort that's gone into trying to persuade the government to stop 
inanely saying no deal is better than a bad deal. No deal is the worst possible deal of all. And that is part of the truth that has to be said. And our job in the end is to use our votes in Parliament, and people will make attempts during the course of the passage of this bill, to be able to push the government in the direction and in the end instruct it by votes in Parliament if it doesn't come to its senses, which it needs to do pretty darn quickly. Right. We, we, I think we, we sort of um, tangentially addressed the second question about you know, the Brexit situation we're in being symptomatic of lack of parliamentary authority, da-da-da. We sort of did a bit of that in the course of this conversation. So I want to end, because we're almost out of time, and I, everybody sort of has to make their way home before too long. How might Machiavelli respond to the situation we are in today? Well, it's quite simple. He would have invaded another Italian province. <laughs> but that is not an option, sadly, that is open to Theresa May. So I'm not sure we can draw that many lessons from Machiavelli on this one. Do we want, would we like, would we benefit from having a super smart Machiavelli in charge right now? Well, there was a superstar Machiavelli in charge of the Leave campaign, Dominic Cummings, right? And I think that's one of the things that people of all sides would acknowledge. And actually, the trouble sometimes with very, very smart people is that they assume that everyone else is stupid. And I think that's one of the things that I think is a real danger. And it comes back to what I was saying at the start about this idea about governing for, by graduates for graduates. Is there, yeah. is, there is too much of an assumption that if you just put a lot of clever people in charge, yeah. they will govern in the interests of other clever people. Mm. And actually, you've got to govern in the interests of everybody. Right. I, I mean, I think Machiavelli might have pointed out that we have a pretty unrepresentative panel tonight. All of us voted Remain. As far as, I, as far as I know, all well, of us voted I, I, Remain. I'm certainly not telling you yeah. how I voted. But well, I'm guessing you voted Remain, but uh, that, that may anyway. be wrong. That may be wrong. Yeah. Um, but um, c- c- just this point about trust. Can I, can I just, uh, the, well, it'll we, you, we are we're not out of time, going so. to... It is for the, bur- the idea that trust in politics is going to be restored. It's the kind of thing that one says at these occasions. It is not going to happen. No one's ever trusted politicians. I mean, go back to the Second World War. Extraordinary polling figures about how you know, Churchill was mistrusted by everybody. We live in an anarchic, messy, much more liberal society, much higher levels of education. We are not going to go back to some good old days where every Everybody trusted the politicians, and thank God for that. All right. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, the the, the witching hour has just passed because it is nine o'clock and and a minute past. So I really think, unfortunately, because I'm just so enjoying listening to my panel, unfortunately, I am going to have to draw things to a close. So before I do, and before I thank you all, I just want to thank my panel. So Ken Clark, Helen Lewis, David Goodhart, Hilary Benn, Anand Menon. Thank you, panel. Thank you. And I, I just want to, I want to send you into this London good night by thanking all of you for being a fabulous audience. Everything from the voting to the questions, fantastic. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and thank you very much indeed.